Let's stand. If you remember the last time I was here, I always have a confession that I do before we start. And I do this simply to get us all kind of on the same page and get us thinking in the right direction. So when I say this, just repeat it after me. I'm a beautiful, I'm a beautiful wonderful, wonderful child, of God. child of God. I'm a friend of God. I'm loved by God, and God likes me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things are possible with God. I have great faith, and it shows. I make wise decisions. God has awesome plans for my future. Well done. You may be seated. I want to start this series, and it'll be this Sunday and the next two Sundays, and I want to talk about living a life of no regrets. And you look at those verses, and it's three different translations of Haggai 1.5, but I like the one in the middle from the message, take a good hard look at your life and think it over. How often do we actually take a look at our life and do we think it over? Do we think much about it? How often do we just jump into autopilot every day and we just sail on out the door and we do whatever it is that we do and we get done at the end of the day and it's like, okay, I waited through Monday and now I'm on to Tuesday. And we don't get very intentional about how we live our lives and what we do. And I believe that within each one of us, God has birthed something. He has placed something within us that we are here to do. Some of you have a dream that you haven't even given birth to yet. And you may say, well, I'm pretty old. It doesn't matter. Moses was how old when he led the children of Israel into the promised land? How old? 80. He was 80. I don't know how many 80-year-olds are sitting here, but most of you are not even close to that. <laughs> I said most of you. Work with me now. <laughs> but I was reading about a couple in California who had gone hiking in the foothills around their house, and they came to a, a meadow um, at the base of the foothills, and it was covered with mushrooms. And they liked mushrooms, and they thought to themselves, why don't we pick these, and let's have a party, and we'll feed our friends. So they picked all the mushrooms, and they loaded them up in their backpacks, and they brought them home. And they figured out how to saute them, they figured out how to bake them, they figured out how to fry them, they figured out how to turn them into a dessert even. Now, I am not a mushroom fan by any shape or form. So when I'm reading this story, I'm kind of like, you, I would not go. So they, they're cooking all afternoon and they're baking and frying and doing all that kind of stuff and they had a really fat cat that was in their kitchen, and the cat sat off into the corner. And every once in a while, they'd just fling a mushroom over there, and the cat would gobble it up and eat it. And They went through the afternoon, got everything ready, invited all their friends, and their friends came over. And they were eating, and the husband went back into the kitchen, and he noticed the cat in the corner. And it's just panting and having a hard time breathing, and it's kind of like foaming at the mouth, and its eyes are look like it's rolled back in its head. And he thought, I bet we poisoned the cat. So he calls his vet. And he tells him what's happened, and the vet says, you better get everybody to the hospital because they need to have their stomachs pumped. You probably ate some poisonous mushrooms. So everybody at the party loads themselves in the car, and they run off to the hospital. They get there. They go through all that ugly process of getting their stomachs pumped. And the couple gets back home to their house, and they're laying in the corner of the kitchen as the cat with a litter of kittens. <laughs> it wasn't dying as he thought. It was just getting ready to give birth. And as we think of a life of no regrets, how many of you have got something where it looks like it's dying and yet you're at the point where God wants to bring birth to something in your life? There's something great that God wants to do in you and through you in your life. The big differentiator with, with all of us is our mortality. We're all going to die one day. Or maybe we will live long enough, Jesus will come back and we'll all go in the rapture. I don't know. But somewhere, this life that we have been given on this planet will come to an end. And it doesn't matter 
if we're rich, if we're poor, no matter our station in life, it's going to happen. But the question that I want to ask you in all of this is, if you knew you had, let's say, one year to live, or you had one month to live, how would you live? What would you do with it? Because there is an end game on all of it, for all of us. It does stop somewhere. It does come to an end. And I don't want you to think about, oh, gee, if I had that short a period of time. Don't let that paralyze or overwhelm you or frighten you. Let it be a motivating thing that causes you to want to live better given that time frame. And none of us know exactly what that time frame is. We don't know when the end game is. We don't know where that's going to happen. So the question in all of this is, what keeps you from living your life like that right now? What is it that prevents you? What is it that holds you back? Is there a legitimate argument that you have as to why you shouldn't live that way? Why you shouldn't be full out in how you live your life and how you present yourself for Christ? If you think back over the last week, what kind of sermon did your life preach? Because each of us were preaching all week long. What was the message that we sent out? But what prevents us from living with that sense of urgency and wanting to do the best that we can? Human nature, we're just, we like to procrastinate and put things off. Any procrastinators in here? Okay, we'll start a little club of our own. <laughs> but we do. Kids in school, you know nine weeks from now, you have a five-page term paper that's due. When do most of us write those kinds of things when we were in school? Maybe it, if, if we were really ambitious, two days before. Generally, it was like the night before. Huh? If you'd open in your Bibles to Psalm 78, we're going to look at several portions of Scripture, but I want to start with that one and ask you a question in regards to that. But if you go to a cemetery and you look at all the headstones that are in a cemetery, you'll find a person's name. You may find a Bible verse on it. You may find a quote or a saying, and you'll see a date of birth, and you'll see the day that they died. And then there's a dash in between those. We don't get to determine when we're born or what family we're born into, what culture we are born into, what time in history we are born into. We don't get to decide when we die. Job writes, he says, you have numbered our days and we cannot exceed them. God has a number of days that you will be alive and then you're done. You don't get to squeeze an extra day out. My grandma lived to be 103 on my mom's side. And that was a statement that she made. She said, someone asked her about living a long life, and she goes, when it's time to go, it's time to go, and you don't have anything to say about it. And you really don't. But the part that we do have control over, it's that dash in between. How are you living between the time you are born and when you die? Are you living a life with no regrets? Are you living at a level that you think you should be at? And frankly, all of us have that. We've got a place where we think we should be living. Now, there are a few delusional people out there that, you know, they're kind of really off base. But there's a, there's a level that we would like to be at in our walk with Christ. We're like, man, if I can live at that level. And that's a little bit of what I want to talk about over the coming weeks. But what keeps you from living that kind of a life right now? What is it that holds you back? You know, do you live that dash and you just go from one place to the next? And that, you'll find that I will ask a lot of questions in the course of, of this series. And another question I want to ask you is, this is your life. Are you who you are supposed to be? Well, my mom told me I should live like this. My spouse says I should be this way. Okay, I understand getting along with people. But far too often, we live for other people. We want to impress someone else. 
or somebody else sometimes wants to control our lives. But it's your life. Are you who you are supposed to be? Even a long life is a fast ride. It's short. I look over the last 30 years of my life, and I'm like, where did they go? And then I look ahead, and I think, okay, my dad was 96 when he died, so I've got another third of my life left to live, which in some ways is exciting. The other part is frightening because you're thinking, you know, you got to retire someday. Are you going to be able to live? But it's your life. Are you who you are supposed to be? Here's another question. What's the biggest fear dictating the way you live your life and exercise your faith? What is it that holds you back? What's that obstacle? What's that roadblock that holds you back? Look at Psalm 78. And um, let's go to verse 19. Psalm 78 and verse 19. This is a story, basically a history of the children of Israel is what's told in this psalm. But it says here, they spoke against God saying, this is the children of Israel, this is what they said, can God spread a table in the desert? Or some versions say wilderness. Can God spread a table in the desert? Can God spread a table in the wilderness? I want you to take that and flip it 180 degrees. Instead of can God, you say God can spread a table in the desert. God can spread a table in the wilderness. And I don't know what your wilderness is. But we've all got them. You might be in a physical wilderness right now. Your health is not the greatest. Relationships might be broken. Finances might be a struggle. I don't know what your wilderness or desert is, but you need to reread this section, and instead of saying, can God do this, you need to say, God can spread a table for me in the midst of all of this. And really, when we get to the end of our life, when we stand before God, his question is not going to be, why weren't you more like so-and-so? His question is going to be, why didn't you live the life I had for you? I don't want to get to heaven and have God pull out a sheet that's five miles long and says, this is all the stuff I had planned for you, but you screwed around so much with your life, we never got to get to this part. I don't want that. I don't want that to be my resume when I get there. Now, let's talk about three things. Number one, do something drastic. Now, I have to say this. I know Pastor Lynn is watching. So, Pastor Lynn, this is for you. When I say do something drastic, that does not mean buy a red convertible while you are gone from here. Okay? Got that? Turn with me to Luke chapter 5, and let's look at this story of where Jesus is teaching in this house, and the place is jam-packed with people. It's a pretty familiar story to all of us. But there's a guy that needs to be healed, and his friends bring him to Jesus to be healed. But due to the crowd, they can't get him in the house. So they're trying to figure out, what do we do now? Where do we go? And they opened a hole in the roof, and they dropped him down and set him in front of Christ. I think a lot of times this is parallel to, to how we kind of live our lives in the sense that the place was so crowded, a lot of times we crowd our lives. And in the process, we crowd Christ out of our lives because we have so many other things going on. And they're all peripheral things. Again, go back to the original question. If you had one year, if you had one month to live, would those things be important? Would you even waste your time, energy, resources on any of that stuff? It's probably not worthwhile. An 87-year-old man was being interviewed, and they were talking to him about regrets. And they asked him if he had any, and he said, yes, I have one. And they asked him, what is it? And how would you change it? And he said, the way I would change that regret and I, he said, I would come back and live as the man I was supposed to be. 
Again, you don't want to get to the back end of your life and go, I wish I would have. My wife and I were talking a few weeks ago about a decision we made right at the very front end of our ministry. And we didn't really take the time we should have to make the decision. In all fairness, when you're young, you know, you're smarter than everybody else in the room, right? You know, 20, 25, 26, you know, you, you know it all. I mean, come on, you don't have to tell me, I get this. And it's a decision that affects us, has affected us for our whole life. And it wasn't a good decision. If you could go back, and there's a song on the radio right now that says, and I think it's Mercy Me that sings it, if you could go back to that one day and change that one decision, all of you just went somewhere right now. You've got one of those just like I do, just like my wife and I do. And sometimes we have more than one of those. But you tip that domino over, and that thing affects how many other ones? That's why you have to think about this, living a life of no regrets, and decide, where do I want to be? And I love this verse at the very end of the passage. It says, we have seen remarkable things today. What if at the end of this week, this month, this year, that was the catchphrase at River of Life? We have seen remarkable things this year. How many of you would be all for that? Lynn, I hope you're watching. There's lots of hands going up. But I want to have some remarkable things happen in my life. I don't want to live that boring, mundane, groundhog day life. Same thing over and over and over again. And speaking of Groundhog Day, Texas doesn't celebrate Groundhog Day. They have Armadillo Day. <laughs> but here's what I like about it. According to them this year, the Armadillo says, no more winter after this. <laughs> now, what's his name? Puxatawney Phil in Pennsylvania said he saw his shadow, so he's hiding for six more weeks. I'm, I'm believing in the people in Texas that winter's going away. Okay. But to say that we have seen remarkable things. But in order to have remarkable things happen, you have to do some drastic things. You can't just do little incremental things. Because small little changes, granted added up over time, but again, we don't know how much time we have. Steve Jobs, the guy from Apple Computer, one of his phrases was he wanted to make a dent in the universe. I'm thinking he probably did. When you look at how many people carry an iPhone, even a smartphone, because it was all kind of came off of what he did, and you look at the computer systems and Apple and Mac and all that stuff, he put a dent in the universe. Now, we may not live at the point where we make a dent like that, but we can make a dent in our universe. Sociology says that even the most introverted person will affect 10,000 people in their lifetime. Well, Rick, I'm just, I'm kind of a quiet, shy person. Guess what? You're affecting 10,000 people. So if you exponentially run this out, and if each one of those 10,000 affect another 10,000, you see where I'm going with this? You've affected a lot of people. I go back to the question I asked you. What kind of sermon did your life preach last week? Because you affected people. Were you Mr. Krabby, Grumpy? Mrs. No Happy Pants? I don't know. But we're all preaching a sermon. We're all saying something. We become what we repeat. Anybody have any habits they'd like to get rid of? Yeah. We become what we repeat. What do you, who do you want to become? Well, you're going to get there by doing the same thing over and over and over. How many of you, when you drove in this morning... You came the exact same way you've come for the last six months. You didn't, you didn't alter, you didn't change. Now, my wife and I, we can honestly say going to church this morning, we went a different way. But we do, we become what we repeat. But the thing is, you have to look at this, don't get stuck on the roof. Do something drastic. Get the obstacles out of the way. 
And we all know what those obstacles are. It could be people, it could be possessions, it could be any number of things. But we've all got something that gets in our way. Second thing is, expect the unexpected. Verse 19 in this chapter says, when they could not find a way. Now, his friends had all prioritized their life. They had, you know, they filled out their little day plan and they're like, okay, this is the day we're taking Joe and we, you know, we're loading him on the stretcher. We're taking him to see Jesus because we saw on the internet that Jesus is going to be at this place. So they had priorities. They had it all mapped out. They knew exactly how this was going to work. But guess what? They got there and they hadn't anticipated that there would be crowds there. They had no idea it was going to be like this. Wouldn't that be great to drive up here some Sunday morning and you're going, I normally park right there, but I can't park there today because there's too many cars. That would be a remarkable day, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm sure we sat in somebody's seat today and we messed you up. <laughs> Our pastor was preaching about that a few weeks ago. He goes, I want all of you to just sit in a different place. If you sit on the main floor, he said, go up in the balcony. If you're in the balcony, go down on the main floor. Just sit somewhere else and mess up somebody's day. And the funny thing was, is the guy sitting next to me, we generally, we're like all of you. It's just like Kyle's going to, to a stanchion. Huh? They got a trail. They know exactly where they're going. We generally sit in the same spot. And the guy that was to our left when we left, when we finished the service, he goes, I normally sit in the balcony if he said, for some reason, I came down here and sat on the main floor. But think about changing what it, what it is that you do. Expect the unexpected. They hadn't planned on a packed house. They hadn't planned on all those people there. So what did they do? Well, Joe, we did our best today. We gave it a good old college try, but it just wasn't our day. We got to go home. No. They rolled up their sleeves and went to plan B. They said, okay, God, what do we do? Where do we go with this? How do we handle this? How do we make this happen? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 3. And let's look at another passage of scripture and talk about making some changes. God is an unpredictable God. And we need to understand that he will do the unexpected in our lives. Wouldn't it be boring if we could figure God out? Then my next question is, then why do I need him if I can figure him out? Because if I can figure him out, then I can do my own thing. I could do it by myself. But 2 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9, it's a story about three kings that were going to war, and they had to go across the desert to get to where they were going. Verse 9 says, So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for their animals with them. They didn't have enough provisions to get across the desert. They hadn't thought ahead about that. They didn't make plans for that. Ladies, this is for you. It says right here, they were after a roundabout march of seven days. Three guys lost, refusing to ask for directions. Here's the biblical context for you ladies. The next time your husband says, I don't need to ask for directions, great. Then you're just like the king of Judah, the king of Edom, and the king of Israel. You're lost. As last year's Easter egg. But finally, these guys come to their senses and they decide, we need to find out, you know, where can we get water? So they realize there's a prophet in the land. Elisha is there. So they go to Elisha. And if you drop down to verse 16, it says, While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha, and he said, this is what he told the kings to do, This is what the Lord says, Make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says, You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. Verse 18, This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. What seemed impossible to them was easy for God, it says. But the prophet tells these kings, who I'm guessing have probably never done any really blue-collar labor, they're kings, they sit on a throne. He tells them, get a shovel and start digging ditches. Start making trenches because the wind and the rain is going to come. You're not going to understand it, 
This was totally unexpected for these guys. Completely unpredictable. Again, that's how I want God to be. But here's the question in the context of this story. What is the ditch that you need to dig for God, or to, for God to bring water to you? What do you need to get rid of? What do you need to remove from your life in order to make a space so God can come into your life? What's the hole in the roof that you need to create in your life in order for God to bring the water and the wind and the rain to you? Or whatever that thing is in the wilderness that you have need of. What's the ditch that you need to dig? We have to allow God to interrupt our plans and our lives. We can't just sail on and just put him in this box and he's good for Sunday morning, he's good for Wednesday night. That's not who he is. We've got to realize God is going to do the unexpected because he's an unpredictable God. And that's the one that I want. Allow him to interrupt your life. Point number three, create some God space. Verse 19, right in the middle, in the middle of this whole deal, they tear a hole in the roof and they drop this guy down right smack dab in front of Jesus. They create space where there is no space. That's what we need to begin to do in our lives is create space for God to move. And I mean this in the nicest way, for God to do his thing. Because trust me, he's got a thing that he wants to do. There's a work that he wants to do in your life. And there's a work that he wants to do through you so you can do some things for him and make an impact in the kingdom. But we've got to be intentional about this creating space. We have to intentionally create this spot and say, God, I need you to move. I will allow you to move. Even Jesus did this. How many times do you read through the Gospels that he went out early in the morning or he went out to a private place? And what did he do? He prayed to the Father. If he needed it, how much more do we need it? We think we can just sail on through and it's not going to make any difference? Here's the interesting thing. If we don't, let's say tomorrow, you don't open your Bible, you don't whisper a prayer tomorrow. You're not going to hell. The wheels aren't going to all fall off the wagon. But see, that's the subtlety of all of it, is we think, okay, if I miss today, it's going to be okay. And it will be. But what happens is, is one day suddenly turns into three, which turns into a week, which turns into two or a month, and all of a sudden you're looking back and you're going, Boy, I regret doing that. I missed that one. Look at this verse in Proverbs. This is out of the Living Bible. Re reverence for God adds hours to each day. Ever had a day when you wished you had like 27 hours? Huh? I mean, you got a lot of stuff you got to do. I'm not saying he'll give you three extra hours, but he will help you multiply and be more productive during the hours that you do have if you honor him first. And I don't mean that in a legalistic way. It's just like, God, I don't know what to do today. I've got this on my plate. I've got this coming at 2 o'clock. I have no earthly idea how to handle this. The best thing that we can do to use our time is to seek him and ask him. And let him begin to multiply those times back to us. Again, if you have a short window, you need him. I need him. We need him. I read about a gentleman who was given a six-month diagnosis to live by his doctor, and he asked the doctor, what should I do? The doctor said, move to the country, buy a pig farm, Marry a widow with 15 or 16 kids. The guy goes, that's going to make my life longer? And he goes, no, but it'll be the longest six months of your life. <laughs> 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 you 
Here's a quote by Irma Bombeck. There are people who put their dreams in a little box and say, yes, I've got dreams. Of course I've got dreams. Then they put the box away and bring it out once in a while to look in it. And yep, they're still there. <laughs> Haven't done anything with it. Haven't accomplished anything with those dreams. But what I want to have happen over the next couple of weeks is I want God to begin to maybe, in some of you, birth a dream. Some of you, it needs to be resurrected and revived. It needs to be brought back to life. It needs to be thawed out. Some of you need a little shot in the arm, a little jolt of something. Some spiritual Red Bull to get you going again. Because we get, we get so caught up in what's happening around us that we forget about that thing. And then pretty soon, we are that 87-year-old guy. And I wish I would have lived as the man I was supposed to be or the woman I was supposed to be. That's not the place I want to end up at. That's not the direction I want to go. But it starts with doing something drastic. Then you expect the unexpected from God. And then you have to create some God space. It has to go that way. Psalm 46.10, very well known. Be still and know I am God. This is where it all begins. This is where all of it starts. Is we have to get quiet before him. And ask him. And, and sometimes with this create space thing, you have to be like those guys where you tear a hole in the roof and you just kind of shove your way in. God is waiting for us, but we got to shove past all the stuff we got going on in our life, all those things that if I had a month or a year to live, it's unimportant and I wouldn't be worried about it and it wouldn't deter me. We've got to decide, how do I get rid of that stuff? Where do I put that? What's the ditch you need to dig? And the word still here means it's like a limb that doesn't work. It's like you, you, it can't lift by itself. You have to lift it. That's what still means. I'm like that limp limb on a body that doesn't work. That's how still you have to get before God. And then we'll begin to hear his voice. And then we'll begin to understand who he is. It doesn't come in other ways. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9, and we'll end with a verse of scripture here, along with some questions. As you're turning there, here's a little thought that you can share with your friends at the Super Bowl party this afternoon. Tomorrow, information says, survey says, some of you are not old enough to remember that game show. <laughs> More people call in sick the Monday after the Super Bowl than any other day of the year. More people miss work tomorrow than any other day of the year. Don't be one of those people. But I want to give you some questions, and there are 10 of them. I'll give you four of them today. And you'll get three more next week, and then you'll get the last three the following Sunday. And don't waste the time trying to write these down. I'll give these to the secretary, and you'll have a copy, and you can look at these. But number one, what's one thing you could do this year to increase your enjoyment of God? What's one thing? What's one step that you could take? Number two, what's the most humanly impossible thing you will ask God for this year? This is one that we've all got. It could be somebody in your family. You're praying that they get saved. It could be a co-worker. It could be a financial thing. It could be a health issue. But you look at it, we look at it, and we say, humanly, this is impossible. And it probably rightfully is. But you know what? That's good. Number three, what's the single most important thing you could do to improve the quality of your family life this year? We'll talk about relationships probably next week. Because, you know, and I realize it's probably completely irrelevant because we all get along. <laughs> all the time. Husbands and wives agree on everything. Nobody's sleeping on the couch. I'm kidding. Number four, in which spiritual discipline do you want to make the most progress this year? And what will you do about it? 
How will you do that? My encouragement to you is find one of these things this week. Which one of these resonates with you the most? And over the course of this week, between this Sunday and next Sunday, which one of these are you going to work on? Which one of these will you focus on? And again, I keep going back to that word intentional. We have to begin to live intentionally. We have to begin to live with focus. Instead of being driven by our emotions. Do we not? Somebody cut you off in traffic? You're right there. But to live with focus and intention. There are three pieces and parts to your emotions. All right? When you have an emotional reaction, there are three pieces and parts to it. Ingredients or habits that we have. First one is a habit of your body. Something happens to you emotionally, and you respond with your body. Maybe you just, you know, you just kind of quit or give up. Maybe you get nervous and you fidget, bite your fingernails. But there are physical manifestations to those emotions. It's a habit. It's an ingredient to our emotions. And we are not our emotions. The emotion will pass. It'll go away. Huh? We've all been mad, and then it went away. We're still us, but the emotion went away. Understand? Okay. This means yes. This means no. It's real simple. The other ingredient is focus. When something goes haywire or sideways for you, where do you, where do you focus on? Is this your focus? Remember Psalm 1? The verse says, but his delight is in what? The law of the Lord? You know what the word delight means? It means inclination. His inclination is to the law of the Lord. When something happens, where are you in, what are you inclined to do? What are you inclined to focus on? Do you run away and escape somewhere? So you have your body, you have your focus, and last of all is language. What do you say, both externally and internally? What are you saying to yourself? Frankly, most of us, we would never talk to another human being the way we talk to ourselves. The things that we say to ourselves, it's awful. I'm, with, I'm, a, I'm in the boat with you. I get it. But when you focus on, when you allow your emotions to get the best of you, you're not living with intention. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. And then he goes on just a few chapters later, chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, verse 23, he says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. What he means when he says permissible you can get mad, you can get angry. The cops aren't going to come and arrest you because you're angry. Okay? I remember we were in a church that we pastored. It was in a rural area. And a wife was talking about her husband, and he had a really short temper. And he was working on something with his tractor, something with a tire. And he couldn't get a nut to come loose. And he got so mad. He stepped back and he grabbed his wrench, and you know, he just fired it at the tire. Well, hit the tire, bounced off, and banged him right in the middle of the forehead. <laughs> Maybe we're not quite to that extreme, but nobody's going to come and arrest you for acting that way. And that's what Paul means, but he says, but it's not beneficial. The meaning of the word beneficial is advantageous. Are the words that you say to yourself, are they advantageous? You know, and then in that first one, I'll not be mastered by anything. Can I borrow your phone for a second? See this little device right here? The world is mastered. Hmm? We were going home last night. We're driving down Veterans, 
Boulevard in West Fargo. The car in front of us, the kid is sitting there, slouched down in the seat like this. I could see his phone just like this as he's driving 45 miles an hour down Veterans Boulevard. I told my wife, if I had an extra thousand bucks, I wish I could pause this tape for a second. <laughs> I said, I'd love, if, if you ever seen those bulletins or those um, highway signs, those things that says, be polite, be nice, you know, it's just a white one and it has black lettering on it. I'd want to put on there, shut off your stinking phone. <laughs> and then the next month I'd run one that says, use your stinking turn signal. <laughs> You have people like that down here? <laughs> okay. But things are permissible, but they're not advantageous. And you go to the, the one in 1023 where it says it's not constructive. Constructive there means leading to improvement. If I do this, it's not against the law. But is this leading to improvement? Does this generate better, greater character in me if I do this? Remember what I said several minutes ago? We become what we repeat. If we keep doing those stupid things, they're permissible, Paul says, but it's not advantageous. It's not beneficial. It's not constructive. It doesn't lead to improvement. If I start down this path, is there a chance that five years from now I could be mastered by this thing? You talk to anybody who struggled with alcohol, and they'll say, had I not taken that first drink, and all of a sudden, 40 years later, they're fighting that demon. Get what I'm saying? But you look at these questions. Now, you're probably wondering what happened to 1 Samuel chapter 9. This is the story of Saul. And apparently on the ranch, they've lost some donkeys. So Saul's father, Kish, sends Saul and a servant out to go and find the donkeys. They take off. They're looking. They can't find them. Pretty soon, they get to the point where Saul says, we need to go home. My dad's going to be worried if we, you know, if we don't come back. Who cares about the donkeys? The servant says, no, let's continue on. There's a prophet or there's a seer in the town where we could, you know, get some. Here we are, a couple guys lost, asking for directions again. <laughs> Ladies are going to love me. <laughs> and they go, okay, let's do this. So if you drop down to verse 18, it says, Saul approached Samuel. Samuel is the prophet here. Remember, this is the time when Israel wanted a king like all the rest of the nations. And they said, we want a king. So God tells Samuel, I'm going to send you here, and this is the guy you're going to look for. This is who you will anoint to be king. That's the back story to this verse 19. And Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, where today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them, they have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and all your father's family? He's intimating to Saul, you are about to become the king. But Saul answers back after he tells him this. Saul says, but I am not a Benjamite. But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such things to me? Saul's self-talk and verbal talk was not very good. Saul was basically discounting himself. And we see this all through Scripture. Remember Moses? You know, I'm not, I can't lead the children of Israel. I can't talk. I can't speak. Gideon, another classic example, hiding in the wine press. And God calls him a mighty man of valor, and he's like, who, me? We do the same thing. We wrestle, and we fight with God. We say, God, that's not me. I don't have the qualifications. Wonderful. Then it's not about you. It's all about, and it should always be all about him anyway. Not my clan. Not me. Why would you say this to me? 
But the question that goes with this story and attaches to a life of no regrets is, Saul was so focused on chasing donkeys, he missed his destiny standing right in front of him. Don't go through 2017 chasing donkeys and you miss your destiny that God has in front of you. He has one. But we need to ask him. So you will, eventually, you'll have to take some drastic action. You will have to do that. You might as well resign yourself to the fact as long as you walk with God, he will do the unexpected. Thank goodness. And you will have to create some space for God to work. You're going to have to get rid of some stuff. You're going to have to get rid of some people maybe. Huh? Do we all not have some people that you walk away and you kind of feel like you just got dumped on? You don't walk away and go, ooh, boy, I feel great after having that conversation. You're like, geez, I didn't need that today. So there may be some of that kind of stuff that you've got to get rid of. The ditch that you need to dig is what? In order for you to stop chasing donkeys and in order for you to start chasing your destinies so you can live a life of no regrets. You don't get to the end and it's just kind of like, yeah, I had 83 years here. What did you do? I don't know. It's amazing. Sometimes you go to funerals and you hear what people say and you're sitting there and you've known this person and you're like, that's not the guy I knew. They're standing up there lying through their teeth. <laughs> he or she was never like that. They were the biggest stinkers in town. You don't want that. And here's the deal. You get to write that story starting today. God makes all things new. We were talking last night. He can take a desert and he can put rivers in the middle of it. He takes the crooked place and he makes it what? Straight. He takes the hilly places and he makes them... Now, we don't have that issue in this state. <laughs> but you know what I mean. So wherever you are, you can begin to write that story that somebody's going to read, and somebody will read it. Somebody will stand up at your funeral, and they will tell stories about you. Decide today, what's the story I want told about my life? The kind of person, the kind of man, the kind of woman that they will repeat when they're standing in front of a casket. It's your choice. Are you going to chase donkeys? Or are you going to chase your destiny? You're going to get to your last days and you are going to regret how you lived your life? Guess what? If you, when you're laying on your dead bed, deathbed, nobody's going to come up to you and go, hey, what was your third quarter profit margin in 2018? No one's going to ask you that question. They're not going to wheel in all your financial statements around your deathbed, but guess who will be there? The relationships that you have, which is based upon the kind of person that you are and the kind of life that you've lived. So when we talk about relationships next week, that's crucial to not living a life of regrets.